Welcome to History Talk, the podcast that brings together experts to discuss current events and historical perspective. My name is Eric Michael Rhodes, and I'm here with my co-host, Lauren Henry. Hi, Eric. Often, we think of humanitarian crises as forces of nature. Droughts, plagues, crop failures, all of these we assume are the root causes of mass suffering. But actually today, the world's largest humanitarian crisis, according to the European Union, is an all-too-human affair, the war in Yemen, or the Yemeni Civil War. The brutal violence that Yemen has witnessed over the past five years has taken an enormous human toll on the nation of 28 million. Conservative estimates count 10,000 civilians among the worst casualties, though many think up to six times more have died. Blockades mean millions face starvation, and the destruction of medical facilities has facilitated the largest outbreak of cholera in recorded history. Many people know little about Yemen, or its politics and history. Yet understanding that history is key to understanding the conflict, whose roots lie in geography, religion, economics, and international relations. Today we'll examine various facets of this conflict, and with the help of two esteemed scholars of Yemen. First, joining us via Skype is Professor Asher Orkaby, a research associate at the Harvard University Davis Center and a lecturer at the Harvard Extension School. Professor Orkaby has published a monograph on the Yemeni Civil War of the 1960s and has contributed regularly to Foreign Affairs, The National Interest, and many other policy publications. Thank you so much for speaking with us today, Professor Orkaby. My pleasure. And joining us in studio today is Dr. Austin Nuppy. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. The Yemeni Civil War has been called the Forgotten War, and it's certainly less well known than other conflicts in the region. Many of our listeners probably won't know much about the country. So let's start with the basics. Who are the main antagonists in this conflict? In its most simplistic level, the Yemen Civil War in its current form is between a Yemeni government, internationally recognized Yemeni government, sitting in exile in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and a government in Sana'a, the capital city of Yemen, run by the northern tribesmen a group called the Houthi movement. And Saudi Arabia and the Emirates have used the cover of the internationally recognized government to intervene in Yemen and to overthrow a regime that uh, the Saudis have often said is uh, aligned with, uh, with Iran and have used this as a cover to stake out claims in Saudi Arabia claims related to uh, to oil and other territorial claims along the border. In essence, the war is between the old republic and a new group of tribesmen who's overthrowing the republic, and behind the scenes is groups of Saudis, Emiratis, and their paid mercenaries trying to stake claims in South Arabia. And that, uh, in a nutshell, is really what the Yemen Civil War is about. Yeah, I like the way you frame that. I guess as a political scientist, there's one that thinks about dynamics of political violence, I would frame it as four interlocking struggles or, or, or four interlocking conflicts. So a- Asher is very good about talking about the the Houthi uh, incumbent regime dynamics of the Civil War going back several decades. I would look at the U.S. counterterrorism operations or U.S. counterterrorism effort in Yemen since 2001. As a dimension, I would think about the um, proxy conflict between the Saudis and Iranians as a regional competition for hegemony or political political control in the Gulf. And then even recently, um, thinking about um, dynamics between various Islamic uh, Islamist insurgencies in South Yemen. So competition for uh, support, capacity, and control among al-Qaeda in the, Islam, uh, in the Al-Rudabian Peninsula and uh, the Islamic State affiliate in Yemen. That these Islamist, Islamist groups are fighting amongst each other for control and influence, independent of the fact they may agree about their broader ideological goals vis-a-vis the U.S. or, or Saudis. So we've heard a little bit about the dynamics here. Would you tell us about the origins of this conflict? How did this conflict begin? As a historian, you you can look five days in the past, you can look five months, you can look 150 years. (laughs) Uh, So we'll start uh, somewhere in between about 60, 70 years uh, and look at actually the origins of of the, the conflict really began during the 1960s when the Republic was first started and marginalizing these groups of northern tribesmen. Fast forward then a few decades of political and economic marginalization to a religious revivalist movement during the 1990s. There's a a prominent family in the north uh, known as the Houthis. Now it's important to note that these Houthis, from a religious standpoint, are part of the Sayyid clan. So Sayyid families are those who have a direct 
descendancy or, or at least trace their family's lineage to the prophet Muhammad and have a at least in a religious sense and a tribal sense have a the top they occupy the top of the social hierarchy after the republic was founded they were put down to the bottom of the social hierarchy especially during the 1990s Saudi Arabia began spread of Wahhabi Islam. So Wahhabi Islam is a form of Islam, Salafi Islam, that goes back, Salafi meaning going back to the tradition, traditional Islam, also prides itself when it's spread proselytization throughout the Middle East. Especially in the northern regions, the Saudi version of Islam was seen as a threat to traditional religious customs in northern Yemen, that's Zaidi customs. Zaid, for a brief, is a, a small sect of Shi'i Islam. The Houthi movement began as a religious revivalist movement, trying to defend the Yemeni religious and social traditions from the spread of, of Saudi Wahhabi Islam. This eventually spread into a political movement in the Northeast Northern Tribes and founded the political party and reached a climax in 2004 when the Yemeni government came to arrest Hussein al-Houthi, who is one of the leaders of this movement, and whose name, in fact, al-Houthi, ended up christening this northern tribal movement. Mm -hmm. And this first battle in 2004 led to a series of six battles between the Yemeni government and the Houthi movement until 2010. After a peace was, was reached in 2010, the Yemeni government at least reached some temporary peace accord with the northern tribesmen. After the fall of the Yemeni president Ali Abdullah Saleh in 2012, there was a power vacuum in essence in many portions of the country, including the north. Uh, and that's where these northern tribesmen, as part of the Houthi movement, were able to carve out a territorial area for themselves. In 2014, the Houthi tribesmen reached the capital city of Sana'a. In 2015, they demand political representation. When it's not given, they take control of the government and send the legitimate government or the internationally recognized government into exile and form their own tribal government in Sana'a. And that's really where the conflict began and all the way up until where it is today. You mentioned the ouster of President Saleh in 2012. To what extent can we see the Yemen civil war as an outgrowth of the Arab Spring? Yeah, I think there's a helpful way to frame it in thinking about the dark unintended consequences of revolution across the Middle East and the Arab Spring, and Yemen being an example of popular revolution creating domestic instability and a power vacuum that it was formerly effectively filled and controlled by autocrats. You saw similar things across the Middle East and Egypt. Effectively, Sisi is no better in terms of representation or governance as his predecessor. The one exception to that is the, the relative success in Tunisia. But more often than not, these democratic revolutions fail to find political representation that can provide both governance and popular legitimacy. Right? Regimes are always balancing governance, the ability to provide security, public goods, economic opportunities with legitimacy, being recognized as having the political authority of broad swaths of civilians across ethnic, religious, economic, regional classes. And so there's a reason these autocrats are very effective at their divide and rule strategies. In the aftermath of that, you see the dark unintended consequences of popular revolution, which is really heartbreaking. There was a lot of excitement in the streets of the capital city, in Sana'a, in Taiz, another major Yemeni city. Uh, and specifically because there was a young generation of Yemenis who saw this movement as of the Arab Spring movement of uh, the call to overthrow a generation of Arab revolutionary dictators and give a new hope to a young generation. And the protest started on that platform. But the problem really was uh, both in Yemen and across the Middle East and North Africa is that if you dismantle the one-party dictatorship that controls the country, the only organization that's strong enough to collectively mobilize the population is the mosque, uh, are the Islamic movements. That was the case in Egypt, that was the case across the North Africa, and also that was the case in Yemen. A previously splinter opposition party known as the Islah movement took control of the Arab Spring, took control of these protests, and saw this as an opportunity to gain in, in stature, and in fact gain 50% of the electorate. So yes, ideally this would have led to a much more equal democracy, but when no one other than the central party, the one party is in Yemen, it's the GPC, and the Islah party, uh, other than those two, nobody really has that ability mm. to collectivize the movement. So it starts as something that's very exciting and something that has a lot of potential, and it is eventually overrun and taken over by organizations with much more convening power and much more political access and money. And that's really what happened in Yemen and, and why the 
Arab Spring protests didn't produce something more consequential and more optimistic in Yemen. What role did Yemen's fragmented history play in the development of tensions between Houthis and the Yemeni government? Of course, our, our listeners might not be very familiar with the longer swath of, of Yemen's history. Sure. So uh, let's look for a moment just at the origins of, of these uh, Houthis themselves. The Houthi movement in itself, not, not all northerners are Houthis, is just a single family. But this single family represents a lost history of Yemen. For over a thousand years, these northern tribesmen and specifically the Sayyid families who are direct descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, had ruled North Yemen and controlled the government for over a thousand years. When this old history of the Imam, who was the religious leader of Northern Yemen, was overthrown in September of 1962, and a republic was established that turned the social hierarchy and the political elite onto its head. So these Sayyid families were now on the bottom of the social hierarchy. That really set the, the northern tribesmen on a collision course with the Yemeni government based in Sana'a. And those tensions really haven't been reconciled in Yemen. And in fact, what, what's faced today, and what the war is really about today, is the Yemenis trying to sit down and make a decision of what type of country they're looking at. Are they looking at a republic? Are they looking at some kind of theocracy? Is it a return to the imamate or is it something in between? And that's the decision that's playing out in, in the field. And, and I'll give one last historical anecdote, and I can turn this question over to Austin. In 1968, there was a Soviet correspondent named Pavel Demchenko, and he was the Soviet correspondent in the Middle East for the Pravda newspaper. After seeing six years of an internationalized civil war, there were 70,000 Egyptian soldiers in Yemen during the 1960s. There were Soviets, Americans, others overrunning the country. Everyone withdrew by 1968, and the Yemenis came up with their own conclusion, or at least the beginnings of a, an agreement between the Republic and the Northern tribesmen. And Pavel Demchenko says something then that I think is very true now. He says, only now, after six years of a bloody internationalized civil war, did we realize that the Yemen civil war was not about the Cold War, it was not about Egyptian-Saudi uh, tensions at the time, but what it was really about was about Yemeni transitioning power. Hmm. And if that's the, uh, the case then, this is also the case now, is that uh, it's not really about the global international politics, but uh, at its core, it's about the Yemenis hmm. figuring out how to reconcile these tensions between the Houthis and the Yemeni government. Yeah, I, I appreciate what, that, what Asher is saying about the kind of the deep underlying social cleavages that affect these conflicts. And I think more often than not, political science, but even policy conversations about the Yemeni civil war, the Saudi intervention, focus on the political, the contemporary politics and, and the fact that if we could control Saudi behavior or end the air war or the intervention or if the Stockholm Agreement of December last year holds and somehow we'll have a tentative peace and we can resolve, reach political agreement. But I think he's Asher's wise to point out that these social cleavages are matters that exist before the Saudi-led intervention, before U.S. involvement, and they're going to exist long after. It's a real similar diagnosis or problem to what we see in contemporary Iraq and Syria and Libya, that these are competitions over really redefining the parameters of, of the state. And I think what we see that provides stability and some level of representation is instances where we have federalized systems of kind of weaker central governments, but really respect for regional autonomy with respect to politics and economics. Iraqi Kurdistan, I think about Cyprus, a place like northern Cyprus, Somaliland, autonomous area of northern Somalia, that these are not fully functioning democratic or developed states, but neither are they failing or weak states. They, mm. they balance the demands for governance and state capacity with local legitimacy, with this hybrid um, hybrid form of political authority. And so that, that may provide um, some, some anecdotes or some successful cases of what to look forward to in terms of restoring governance to Yemen. As Asher points out, it's not going to be a function of U.S., Saudi, or even Iranian state building or, or proxy war. It's going to be a function of domestic politics in Yemen and sorting, you know, sorting these cleavages. Very curious to hear about what you both think the way forward is. But just for our listeners who may not be sort of familiar with the thicket of international involvement on the ground in Yemen, Dr. Nepi, if you wouldn't mind just walking us through who exactly is in Yemen, why they're in Yemen, and what they're doing there. You've alluded to both uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, and I know that there's a United States presence as well. And What's the sort of what's at stake on that level of your sort of interacting viewpoints of the civil war? 
Certainly. So, yeah, Asher has pointed out kind of the domestic politics or the, the nature of the domestic actors involved in the Civil War. As someone that studies international politics, I would look at the role of, of regional states in the U.S. So if we start with the U.S., uh, U.S. has uh, traditionally involved a pretty cohesive political relationship with Saleh, the former president, and that particularly after September 11, 2001, there was tacit coordination on counterterrorism, not only because the U.S. was interested in fighting the so-called global war on terror, but also because Saleh wanted to consolidate power and control, right? He was worried about domestic Islamists, whether or not it's al-Qaeda in the Islamic Peninsula or any of its affiliates, threatening his control. And so we worked with Arab autocrats rather effectively from the counterterrorism perspective at identifying and eliminating these groups, despite the fact that we we're fundamentally undermining foreign per- U.S. perceptions of legitimacy on the ground. And so you have a U.S. counterterrorism mission in Yemen that involves what we call a light footprint. It's not lots of U.S. ground troops marching around Yemen. It's special operations. It's a drone war. It's coordinating with the with the Yemeni military, all in the kind of a shadow war, a, a kind of a, a more discreet So to be very clear, yeah. you're speaking contemporarily. Contemporary, yeah, since, since 2001. The United States government is supporting the, the internationally recognized government. How does the United States interface with this civil war conflict? Yeah, in three different ways. So before the abdication of Hadi really worked with the internationally recognized government in counterterrorism. Now it's uh, coordinating with uh, Saudi Arabia and the Saudi-led coalition. And it's actually the United States is basically operating independently of the Yemeni government and the Saudis to wage direct counterterrorism uh, interdiction for al-Qaeda and Islamic State affiliates in the region. So it's, it's operating through local actors as well as independently to pursue its counterterrorism interests. The irony amongst this, and, and I'll, I'll just add in over here, mm-hmm. uh, is that there's really only one power in in the region that's, that's actually fighting groups traditionally known as al-Qaeda mm. uh, and ISIS. And you know, that's not the Saudis. Ironically, that's the Houthis. Yeah, that's right. Part of this is a division between Sunni and Shi'i Islam. Is a brief uh, background. So Sunni and, and Shi'i Islam are the two main groups of Islamic theology. This goes back centuries to to the roots of Islamic religious history. For the for the intensive understanding, of Yemen, the Zaydis, which are the Houthis' main religious body, are staunchly Shi'i, staunchly uh, Zaydi, and see the spread of groups like Al Qaeda and like ISIS and frankly, like the Saudi Wahhabi movement, which is very close in line in a doctrinal level to Al-Qaeda, sees them as invading Yemen, both religiously and practically, and with actual troops on the ground. That's part of the irony of, of U.S. policies. You're forced into a corner to recognize an international government, and that's currently under Pro- President Mansour Hadi sitting in a luxury hotel in Riyadh <laughs> with no legitimacy on the ground in Yemen, but yet still occupies every ambassadorial role, occupies the UN, while at the same time you have a group of, of Houthis, these northern tribesmen, who hold a monopoly on legitimacy in Yemen, but are not internationally recognized. And even though they fall in line with a lot of U.S. Counterterrorism policy doesn't necessarily translate into practical diplomacy or international affairs. That's been historically a very tragic uh, bit, but as the current situation is that it's very difficult to get past that sense of internationally recognized governments, even though they're sitting in exile. I think it's a great point. It's important to note as well that U.S. policy vis-a-vis Yemen is really bifurcated. It's one of these rare instances where you have the U.S. Congress resurrecting the 1973 War Powers Act to reassert congressional authority over U.S. military action in Yemen. And yet in the executive branch with President Trump and his close acolytes, the very personal transactional, personal-based diplomacy with the, Saudi, the House of Saud and Saudi Arabia. And so even within the United States, when we're having these debates about the role of U.S. foreign policy in Yemen, there's a division between the interests in the Congress and what President Trump and his close allies are trying to accomplish. I mean, the United States does not have an ambassador to Saudi Arabia at this point. And so it's all very personal transactional diplomacy. And despite the fact that the Congress is, has voted against uh, U.S. efforts there, it looks like President Trump most certainly will veto that. And Congress doesn't have a veto-proof majority to kind of retrain, uh, regain congressional control of, of U.S. support for the Saudi coalition. So even within the United States, we're divided as to the, the proper role of, of U.S. assistance in, in, the, in the Civil War. So just for our listeners' sake, um, Dr. Orkabi, you mentioned that President Hadi, who was Saleh's successor, is in exile in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. So what are Saudi Arabia's historic interests in Yemen? I think that's a great question because uh, without understanding the long history of Saudi-Yemeni tensions, it's difficult to understand what the Saudis are doing, what their end goal is, and and then on a more practical level, how do we solve Saudi-Yemeni tensions? For this, you need to go back to, to 1933, shortly after 
Saudi Arabia was first founded. There's a famous, could be apocryphal episode, as the founder Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia sends an emissary, a peace emissary to the Yemeni imam at the time, the leader, uh, Imam Yahya, and asks him to resolve a Saudi-Yemeni border dispute. Saudi Arabia and Yemen share a very large border. And to this request, Imam Yahya of Yemen responds, who are you calling uh, Ibn Saud the Bedouin to come tell me, uh, a settled Bedouin, uh, for the past 900 years, uh, what I should and shouldn't do? So there's a cultural aspect to it in terms of uh, nomadic Bedouins versus settled Bedouins in Yemen. But beyond that, this really underscores the border tensions between Yemen and Saudi Arabia. Uh, and of course, when uh, this emissary was ejected, Yemen and Saudi Arabia fought their, their, for, their first border war, uh, first of many tensions along the border, and concluded in 1934 something known as the Treaty of Taif. Now, this Treaty of Taif, what was important about it, so Yemen loses the war and is forced to cede three provinces over to Saudi Arabia. These provinces are called Asir, Najran, and Jizan. Asir may be familiar to a lot of people because that's where a lot of the 9-11 terrorists had come from. They're, in fact, Yemeni culturally and religiously, but are part of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and these three provinces has been, have been at the corner of Yemen-Saudi conflict for the decades since 1934. At each point that the Yemeni government seems to be emerging as a strong central government, Saudi policy has been to counteract that strong central government. There were episodes both during the 1960s when the republic was first founded, during the 1970s when Yemen had a particularly strong president named Ibrahim al-Hamdi, and also when Yemen first unified in 1990, creating a unified Yemen and a threat to Saudi Arabia, because one of the first declarations of the Yemeni government was, we're going to retake the three provinces. Fast forwarding then to the Houthi movement to understand how that fits into the Yemen-Saudi conflict, the Houthis, one of their first items on the agenda was, we're going to retake these three disputed provinces. So the Houthi government is not a threat because of Iran, but it's a threat because of the Saudi-Yemen border tension that has been a very large part of Yemen historic Yemen-Saudi tensions. Part of solving the Saudi coalition's problem, the Saudis' issue with uh, with Yemen, is solving that southern border crisis. Creating stability along the southern border will go a long way to alleviating Saudi-Yemeni tensions. I wanted to ask about the coalition aspect of it, that we're, sl- we're slowly widening out our viewpoint here, that we sort of t- started talking about these internal tensions, and now we're looking at the tensions between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. But who makes up this coalition and why are they involved here? And what, what role does Iran play in all of this, either in their motivations or in the progress of the conflict itself? The Saudi-led coalition in March 2015 is a function of the Saudi military, the Emiratis. Uh, if that's asked, it may also be the Egyptians. They don't have a, a large military footprint, but it's dominated by the Saudis mm-hmm. and Emiratis, supported by the United States. And this is an example of the U.S. providing... Uh, not flying alongside Saudi warplanes, but rather providing a lot of sophisticated air-to-air refueling, logistics, intelligence, and munitions. So it's incredibly complicated to wage an air intervention absent ground troops. And so the U.S. has provided kind of the necessary logistical support for the Saudis to continue their their their, their sorties or aerial sorties over Yemen. At the same time, uh, the Emiratis, known as the Sparta, the Sparta state of the Persian Gulf, have s- sought to to exercise some military strength in the region as well. They've sent ground troops into Yemen. They're supporting, as Asher mentioned, the southern kind of transitional breakaway forces that are funding Islamist groups that are incredibly effective at combating Houthi, Houthi insurgents. And so there's a combination of, of U.S. support for the, the Saudis and Yemenis and also indirect security assistance to local groups opposed to, to the Houthis, all in an effort to counter an Iranian proxy war and support for the Houthi movement. So the Saudis are concerned certainly about border security and regional hegemony in the Gulf. They also look, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, and and really a nexus of political power in the kingdom, looks across the Gulf, sees the Iranians, sees the Iranian military success at advising, assisting, and supporting proxy forces in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, and is increasingly worried of successful proxy support in Yemen that would that would undermine their political and security, and for a good reason, right? I, you, you saw Houthi Houthi forces launching Scud missiles, kind of regional missiles, into civilian centers into Saudi Arabia. So these are not unfounded security concerns. At the same time, they very well could be embellished or accented in an effort to gain U.S. compliance. 
And so there's a very real Saudi-Iranian kind of proxy war contention, even as there is dynamics of an internal civil war. The U.S.-Saudi relationship is very much at the center of this. Trump's, the, the president's relationship with the crown prince. You have international, local, and regional political dynamics all interacting, which makes it really an intractable conflict. Just taking it back in, in history for a second to explain coalition. So uh, on, a, on a very fundamental level, a coalition, the Saudi coalition is really about dollars and cents, is that the Saudis can offer a significant amount of money to any country willing to support this coalition to make it seem like an international mm. coalition. So obviously dollars and oil money definitely does speak. Mm. But in terms of, of the regional conflict, if you think back to the 1970s and Saudi American relations during the 1970s, there's some really great lines from King Faisal and others uh, after him pointing to the danger of communist takeover in Saudi Arabia during the 60s and 70s. And you see various U.S. presidents reacting to this with, with alarm that if we don't, if the United States does not aid Saudi Arabia, then communists will take over. The communists were never going to take over Saudi Arabia. It's a various mm-hmm. number of reasons, just you know, mostly religious reasons, would never have stood for a communist state. Nonetheless, as soon as you say that unless you support Saudi Arabia, then there'll be a communist takeover, then not supporting Saudi Arabia will be politically disadvantageous. Mm -hmm. And the same is true in the current climate. As soon as Saudi Arabia declares that the Houthi movement is an Iranian proxy, immediately there'll be calls within the United States and elsewhere to support the anti-Houthi forces because any failure to do so would be a failure, a, a real political gambit, because not looking tough on Iran would... Uh, would not work well in the elections, etc. Uh, so that's really what it's about. Uh, how much the Iranians actually influence the, the Houthis, uh, uh, it's probably tenuous at best. A limited amount of material uh, weapons that actually get into Yemeni territory. And uh, Austin, you mentioned the, the Scud missiles. If you actually look at the origin of those Scud missiles, uh, they go back to the second Yemen civil war in 1994 between North and South Yemen. So South Yemen, there was an arms embargo against South Yemen. None of the Western countries are willing to arm South Yemen, except Mm. Saudi Arabia, who had an interest in dividing Yemen. The only country who was willing to sell Saudi Arabia arms at the time was North Korea. So these uh, Scud missiles were purchased ostensibly for South Yemen by Saudi Arabia from North Korea. But the problem is, by the time the Scud missiles arrived in Yemen, in the southern Yemeni port city of Aden, the war was over. So these Scud missiles became property of the Yemeni army and are now being launched at Saudi Arabia. So, uh, sure, Saudis are concerned, but uh, the, the only fault is, is in them for arming the Yemeni military with hundreds of Scud missiles who are now being launched on Saudi Arabia. So it's a bit of an ironic twist, but it, it's one that you need to understand within the context of broader U.S.-Saudi relations. Speaking of the impacts of the, the war, who's getting hit hardest by these Scud mm. missiles? How has this conflict precipitated what the European Union calls the world's largest humanitarian crisis? What kinds of privations do ordinary Yemenis face today? The current conflict's really exacerbated a lot of underlying humanitarian dynamics that's going on in Yemen. We see that there's an increasingly widespread cholera epidemic. The war has introduced increased deprivation in terms of access to food and fuel. When you have conflict at these key ports, It's not that they don't have access to food, but it's it's, uh, distributing food, humanitarian aid, fuel, etc. You have all these dynamics that are really exacerbated by climate change. Yemen really suffers under an incredible amount of drought. It may be one of the first countries we see functionally run out of water in the coming decades. And so you have the climate dimension. You have the cholera, the public health dimension. You have lots of international aid organizations trying to deliver aid, but distributing it, protecting these organizations and being able to really meet the public health needs and and, uh, malnutrition, et cetera, is really what's complicated. It's incredibly complicated logistically to deliver aid in the midst of a fighting. And so part of the design of this tentative peace agreement last December was to create some breathing room for for immediate humanitarian relief. I think a a lot of our our U.S. listeners won't realize that the humanitarian situation in Yemen is far worse than in Iraq or Syria, despite the fact that the fighting is more pitched in a place like in the Syrian civil war. Austin, you, I think you're right. If you look at the statistics, definitely a number of cholera epidemics, and even more so if you see a picture of a starving child, your yeah. heart is going to pour out to this. And anybody whose heart does not that should, uh, should definitely reconsider where their sympathies are lying. But 
beyond those statistics and beyond those heart-wrenching photos, I think it's important to to look at what's actually going on in Yemen. Mm. Uh, and and without bringing up any any specific names or organizations, it's it's clear that the number of cholera victims is actually far exaggerated. It's hard to get uh, statistics in an area of the world where you don't have a centralized medical record. So. Mm which means you could have one person come in with cholera and then assume that a thousand more haven't come in. In addition to that, it's extrapolating those numbers. Mm -hmm. Uh, And especially in Yemen, where the diagnosis of cholera could be definitely conflated with other stomach ailments. Anybody who comes in with an upset stomach, you assume it's cholera. Mm. So that inflates the numbers. So are there a million cholera victims? Probably not. And uh, from from the research I've done, it's probably closer to between 10 and 100,000. But uh, nonetheless, and you ask, uh, why does this why does this continue? And uh, understanding also about Yemen, I think also you made a good point that Yemen has always been rain dependent. Its history for thousands of years has always been uh, one of periodic famines, sparked by which then lead to to conflict. So yeah, when you have a, a rain dependent economy and a rain dependent agriculture, you're going to have spikes and falls in in agricultural production. Uh, it was actually part of the reason why Yemen is running out of water is, is because uh, of misplaced U.S. aid mm. dollars mm. during the 1970s and 80s where uh, wells were dug in, in many of these vill- villages as part of a wide-scale se- self-help program. Uh, but when you dig wells and you don't teach conservation, water conservation at the same time, then eventually the wells stop producing water. But if you don't teach that conservation, then you end up coming up with, uh, with that. Just you know, then a point. Then w- with all of that considered, looking at the humanitarian aid, the amount of humanitarian aid that the European Union has declared uh, for this year is four billion dollars. To put that into context, with Yemeni's population, it comes out to about 140 dollars per Yemeni that has been dedicated for humanitarian aid. And that equals about 10% of, of the per capita GDP in, in Yemen. So this humanitarian aid has become the, one of the largest, if not the largest, natural resource that Yemen is producing in the current fiscal year. Uh, it's disincentivizing any end to this conflict by constantly dumping additional humanitarian aid onto the conflict. You create a wartime economy that's uh, s- self-sustaining in, in essence. The, the longer mm. this war goes on, the more humanitarian aid is coming in. And uh, you can be assured, as Austin said, that that humanitarian aid is not necessarily going to the people who need it the most. You can find food in Yemen. Problem is, is that the purchasing power for most of Yemenis with a falling uh, real with currency is almost near impossible to p- actually purchase uh, these goods that are given for free by the international community and then turned into a wartime economy. So uh, it sounds almost heinous to say, but if anything, humanitarian aid has been exacerbating the humanitarian conflict. Aid needs to be given more judiciously. And frankly, the European Union has been hiding behind increased numbers in dollars amounts for humanitarian aid rather than actually addressing the situation. It's easy every time to hide behind a larger and larger, whether it's $2 billion, $3 billion, or $4 billion in humanitarian aid without actually putting your policies on the line in Yemen and actually intervening in a more substantive way, hiding behind this humanitarian aid, calls for end to violence and all these other catchphrases without actually producing anything of consequence in Yemen. So it's a bit different than what you'd hear on, on regular media, but that's, that's, uh, th- that's in fact the reality of what's happening in Yemen. I think that's a great point. I mean, in political science, we spend a lot of time talking about the aid trap or these perverse negative consequences to foreign aid. I, I think about Asher's comments remind me of what's going on in Afghanistan, where at some point in the last five or six years that international investment aid accounted for a majority of Afghan national GDP. So it was it was either foreign aid or, or, or heroin production. That was the vast amount of economic production, uh, production in the state. How do you expect local actors to adjudicate concerns over sovereignty and territory and political authority when they're dependent on these rev- external revenue streams, basically. And so so there's a, there's a perverse incentive to exacerbate the conflict, to attract increased levels of security assistance and foreign aid to something that are using, manipulating strategically for these, these local actors to advance their interests. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that, that's absolutely right. Dr. Nappi, that you mentioned the truce in the port city of Hodaya that came into effect in December 2018. And Dr. Orkaby, you also mentioned this idea that the European Union could possibly be taking a different role 
or should possibly be taking a different role. I was wondering if you could talk to us about the attempts that have been made to solve this crisis, to end the war so far. What does that what does that look like and what has the effect been? Has it been effective at all? You know, are we at a turning point or what has been done? Yeah, so I, I think that there's two sides of this. There's the, the Stockholm Agreement of December, I think it was, 2018, where you had representatives from the Houthi movement and the, the, the international uh, regime or government met in Stockholm to, over the course of a week or so, to adjudicate an immediate uh, temporary suspension of hostilities to adjudicate some of these concerns. And there's a big focus on humanitarian relief and having the United States leverage their relationship with Saudi to pause it, the air war in order to kind of adjudicate some of these concerns. There's lots of debate over getting access to these port cities. There's southern Yemen and, and Aden, but also Hudaydah, which is a source of, uh, of a lot of political fighting and political violence, major port access for food and, and, and relief. And so a lot of these were these these micro kind of immediate term political negotiations that kind of get some traction on, on, on the larger term conflict. From the perspective of U.S. foreign policy, uh, like I mentioned, you've seen even in the last two years, you've had members of the Congress and Senate reassert congressional authority under the War Powers Act, which was a product of the Vietnam War, to try to arrest or, 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 or inhibit the executive branch's ability to support the Saudi coalition. Like I mentioned, they don't have veto-proof majority for in either house, and it's most certain that the, the Trump administration will veto check on executive power. But even in the context of U.S. foreign policy, you have two conflicting – you have the congressional interests and then you have – the Trump Trump administration's kind of unusual, very interpersonal relationship with autocrats around the world, but Mohammed bin Salman in particular, and and the kind of the transactional nature of of, of Saudi support. A lot of uh, what's happening in the international community, actually, the two most important things to come out in the past six months have come out of Stockholm. So one is is also mentioned is the Stockholm Agreement, where the UN envoy finally managed to get some quorum or representation together in Stockholm and. The best thing I think that's, that's come out of this conflict for Yemenis is uh, some really great comedians have come out of here and have made their careers on, on mm-hmm. political political satirists. And some of the best photos that have come out of the Stockholm Agreement are Yemenis who are used to relatively mild co- climate coming to Stockholm where it was below zero temperatures. And uh, you see them coming in with these jackets, maybe three, four or five jackets and trying to stay warm in this uh, Swedish temperature. And uh, and then uh, some of the Houthi representatives coming back and, you know, what what kind of joke was this taking us to such cold climates? How did the Europeans live? Those sorts of questions. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, it underlined only slightly the ridiculous nature of how this international diplomacy has been conducted. Previously, the Yemeni government and the Houthis during the 2004 to 2010 conflict took advantage of the Qataris and a really safe negotiating space in Doha to come up with two substantive agreements, uh, the Doha agreements, one and two. And honestly, these should have been the basis to the international community's dialogue and diplomacy. But the way the UN works is, is really a bit hegemonic in terms of the way they run their diplomacy. It's always been so. And Unfortunately, is really the case in Yemen as well. Back in the 1960s, the UN Yemen Observer Mission was in Yemen to oversee the withdrawal of foreign forces, Egyptian and Saudi, during the first civil war. Much of it was constrained by international diplomacy and politics. This is also true but after the, the Arab Spring, Jamal bin Omar, who at times was, was touted by the Obama administration as a hero for overseeing post-Arab Spring reconciliation in Yemen, turns out that while he was organizing something called the National Di- Dialogue Conference, the NDC in Yemen in 2012, that the only reason that Yemenis were staying in this conference is because Jamal bin Omar, who was the UN Special Envoy, was giving out envelopes of cash, convincing people to come to this dialogue conference. It was months on a really expensive hotel bill in the Movenpick in Sana'a. It's a nice, or was a nice hotel. Uh, and a lot of Yemeni tribesmen and leaders love the fact that they can, were wined and dined for about six months to talk about Yemen's future. But the UN didn't really understand what the conflict was about. and was more about the, the photo ops, whether it's Yemenis wearing a lot of jackets or Houthi shaking a hand with mm-hmm. an internationally recognized government. The other bit that's really coming out of Stockholm is something that didn't receive the same attention. It's the CIPRI, the Stockholm Peace Research Institute. And about uh, three, four weeks ago, came out with a study that, in fact, the United States does not have a monopoly on weapon sales to Saudi Arabia. Uh, 
or to any other country in the world. So that congressional calls pressure on the U.S. president to pull back U.S. support from Saudi Arabia may sound very good in terms of backing humanitarian human rights and, uh, and peace conflicts, but won't have a positive effect on the Yemen civil war. And in fact, pulling back U.S. role in, in this civil war would take a real leverage point away from international diplomatic efforts because the Saudis could easily go to another country, whether it's the Chinese weapons industry or the Russians uh, or India, uh, and get uh, similar weaponry. They might have to le- uh, a lull of retraining their, their soldiers in new weapons. The Chinese would give weapons to Saudi Arabia without those same checks and balances on Saudi policy. So if anything, pulling back the United States and its role in the war may actually exacerbate this conflict because it would give a carte blanche to Saudi policy to do whatever they want without having to answer to a Western public. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's that's one of the more principal arguments to make in favor of using the U.S.-Saudi relationship as a mean to check Saudi behavior. At the same time, there would be, I think, a period of adjustment. I think the Saudis have outside options. At the, you know, at the same time, right, they're flying American fighter jets that require replacement parts and munitions, intelligence and logistics support. These are incredibly complicated means of assistance that maybe could be, you could supplement it with a different revenue stream, so to speak, but it would take some time. It would be far less effective than, than, than U.S. military assistance. And so I think it's a toss-up and it's a point of contention whether or not U.S. support for the Saudi coalition is a means of credible assurance to control Saudi behavior, or if the U.S. are basically being taken for a ride using basically the Saudis to extract U.S. support to to pursue their local political interests independent of U.S. authority. And either either way, I think we're, there's not a lot of good options for, for U.S. ability to, to influence or temper Saudi, uh, Saudi behavior in the Gulf. So we've heard a little bit about current efforts to establish peace in Yemen, and this is a podcast about the past, so we try to resist the urge to prognosticate. Um, That being said, let's prognosticate and ask, what does a way out of conflict look like for Yemen, and what will it take to reach a resolution? I can offer a solution, one which I've, I've been working as of this morning with Yemeni groups to to implement is something of a, a federal state in, in Yemen. Now, that's, that's often difficult to to manage, but if you actually look at the fault lines of the military today, there's a North Yemen, there's a South Yemen, and there's an East Yemen. Mm-hmm. Uh, North Yemen being the one that's currently controlled by the Houthis, the South Yemen, which is a combination of the Southern Transitional Council, and a group called al hirak the Southern Liberation Movement. And then in East Yemen, there's a traditionally autonomous region of Hadramaut, which literally means the gates of death, but is also a has some of the most beautiful desert oases uh, and is also very wealthy. So you're looking at three, essentially three regions in, in Yemen that rather than break up into separate states, as had been the case in the past, can form a federal state. The background to this historically is that prior to the unification of Yemen and these three parts of Yemen in 1990, there was no concept of a united Yemen. Yemen mm-hmm. didn't exist as in the political boundaries that it had today. So really it was in 1990, Ali Abdullah Saleh, the former president of Yemen, putting together these three parts of Yemen and trying to create one out of them. Maybe that is what failed, that unification. So the solution would be given those northern tribesmen that are part of the Houthi movement, the political equality and power that they have been advocating for for several decades, giving the southern movement the independence and autonomy that they have sought within the Yemeni context, and finally giving the Hadramis in the east that autonomy that they've had for centuries, but yet putting the three together in a loose and and weak central government in Sana'a that would really give that that Yemen the final solution for its major political tensions and problems. And in terms of the Saudis, it's helping the Saudis maintain that southern border. And most importantly, that the southern border tensions that have really fueled this conflict, the UN could actually do something productive rather than hold expensive meetings in Stockholm mm-hmm. is to put an observer group along the border, something similar to what was done during the 1960s, to ensure that the Houthis don't attack the Saudis and that the Saudis aren't infringing on Yemeni sovereign territory, 
that would go a long way into alleviating those tensions and also giving the Saudis a face-saving measure to withdraw from the Yemen conflict and still declare victory as having secured their southern border. I think that's right. I think the, the federalism solution is intriguing. There's a lot of contemporary analogs that we can point to that are they're fairly successful. I think I mentioned uh, the um, uh, Cyprus conflict, right? Northern Cyprus, Moldova, uh, Somaliland, Somalia, basically this, this semi-autonomous region of, of northern Somalia functions pretty effectively, despite the fact that it's neither democratic or liberal in any traditional sense of the word. Um, so I, I like this idea of the federalism and, and, and giving local stakeholders some political authority and, and, and keeping political authority diffuse. I think there's a lot of question marks with that approach in, in, in southern Yemen with the Southern Transition Council. And to what extent do, can we ensure, can local uh, Yemeni political authorities ensure that you don't have a, re- a semi-autonomous region that's basically a de facto caliphate or can, under the control of the uh, al-Qaeda in the, the Arabian Peninsula or the Islamic State in Yemen. We, we want indigenous kind of bottom-up governance to emerge, at the same time ensuring that foreign fighters don't bath- basically create their own form of governance. So we have limited effectiveness in that, but from the, the interest of U.S. policy, we still have an interest in, in making sure that domestic governance isn't basically turned over to, to al-Qaeda's uh, the wider network. Yemen can't be solved in a day, but we made it an effort. We'll wrap it up on that note. Thank you again to our two guests, Dr. Asher Orkaby and Dr. Austin Nubby. Our pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. This episode of History Talk was brought to you by Origins, Current Events and Historical Perspective, an online publication of the Public History Initiative, the Goldberg Center, and the History Departments at The Ohio State University in Columbus, and Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Our main editors are David Steigerwald, Stephen Kahn, and Nicholas Breivogel. Our audio and technical advisor is Paul Kotheimer, and our audio producers and hosts are me, Lauren Henry, and Eric Michael Rode. Song and band information can be found on our website. You can find our podcasts and more on our website, origins.osu.edu, on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, as well as wherever else you get your podcasts. And as always, you can find us on Twitter, at OriginsOSU and at HistoryTalkPod. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next month.